I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking to Mr. Greg Jackman, physical education teacher out of Newfoundland, Canada. I met him many years ago, and he was a kind man then, and I'm pretty sure he's a kind man now. So what I would like to find out is where his motivation came from as he got into physical education, but also what he does when life pushes us off course, when we lose people, when work doesn't go the way we think it should, and how does he get back on course and stay motivated to teach the kids that he teaches. Join me in this conversation with Mr. Greg Jackman. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking to Mr. Greg Jackman. Good day, fine sir. Hey, buddy. How are you? I'm doing well. You and I have had a chat for the last little bit, and I've enjoyed it immensely going down memory lane all the way back to our Acadia years. Would you be able to give us a little idea of what you're doing now? And then we'll circle back to that later. Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm currently employed in Newfoundland, Labrador, province in Canada, uh, as a physical education specialist, or as some people would call it, a gym teacher. Uh, that's my primary gig day to day. We go back to work tomorrow with kids in the building. Um, and as I mentioned, I've just taken on a side gig as a fitness trainer. So I spend my days teaching phys ed and fitness to kids and my evenings with adults. It's almost like uh, Batman or, or Spider-Man or someone. <laughs> by day I do this, by night I do this, but you're doing the same. Yeah, pretty so much. You, yeah. you must love it. Greg, can you bring us back to what would have been or what was your very first job and how old were you? Uh, I, well, I mentioned I've cheated a little bit because I, I do follow your podcast. So I, do, I was prepared for some of this. Yeah. Um, the first work... I was ever introduced to was with my dad and my grandfather, like just labor work around the yard, you know, uh, from a very young age, helping cut and stow firewood for the winter or uh, fairly young age, responsible for mowing lawns, which branched off. Sorry, be, sorry, Greg. And no problem. Things, like, things like this, I don't want to, to gloss over, as I say, because those are really good th ways of learning work ethic with family, yeah. piling, piling wood, right? Yeah. Splitting wood, piling wood, getting the wood yeah. out in the winter time, go get a log and put it on the fire. Those are great things that some, maybe even as a teacher, you can see that some parents or guardians or people that are in these children's lives are not giving them those little responsibilities that actually are a great foundation into work. Completely. Yeah, I'd agree with that 100%. One of my favorite pictures um, of myself is with my grandfather, who I was very close with. And it's a picture somebody chose to snap when I was probably about 15 years. And we're both decked out in our coveralls and just leaning against a pile of wood that we're about to put a chainsaw to. And it's one of my favorite pictures. But now it's my favorite picture because it's with my aunt. Yeah. But... That's what we spent a lot of time doing was working together from a pretty young age. Like I think parents should be encouraging work ethic more, quite a bit more. Actually, I admire my sister quite a bit. She's got two boys and, and, and she's in, instilling that in them. Um, but on the flip side of that, I sometimes think back that I might've been given a little bit of, for such protective parents, they gave me a little quite a bit of leeway in the workforce yeah. with the, the work they had me doing and the machinery I was doing. With, with that said, I was always supervised, I guess, but I was working hard, no doubt. So you were saying after piling wood and stuff with your grandfather and your dad, you got into, what was it? So, and that spurred once I was, you know, trusted enough to operate lawnmowers and stuff, I was responsible for the vast properties that, my grandparents lived in the neighboring yard, both large properties, and I was, I was on task of, lawn maintenance pretty much to myself all summer long and then that evolved in my small i'm from a community of about 500 people uh and i became the neighborhood lawn mower uh, lawn boy so pretty much yeah and uh you know i made a few dollars for myself here and there doing that 
uh the first what was, thing that, what was what was your motivation greg is it just because uh it was your grandfather's okay that's the friend of the you know it's a small town that's a friend they're just asking you so you you feel obligated to do that or did you have a more deeper motivation of getting out there and working i've never really been driven by money though i do recall enjoying getting paid yeah. obviously yeah but I don't know, Brian, if I ever really thought about that, but you might have just planted the answer for me. Actually, I think I felt like it was kind of my duty in that little town. There was only a handful of, you know, young, able people, yeah. people to do it. Like, literally, I went to a two-room schoolhouse for kindergarten one-two mm -hmm. uh, before I got shipped off to the big town of Clarenville for school. And out of, like, when I went to kindergarten, there were only five of us. You know what I mean? So each age group was pretty limited sadly not everybody does have yeah. that motivation i i think i felt like it was my responsibility now i also had a little bit of insight into getting to know a lot of households mm -hmm. because another job that i did have through high school i delivered the week weekly newspaper that came out from clarenville so dad and i did that together my my town of 500 was stretched over a few miles so dad would run me around on his pickup truck Tuesday evenings before we went to hockey practice and I'd be running up on people's bridges with their door, with their paper. And it wasn't flinging on the door. It was knock on the door and have a chat with the little old lady inside and, and dodge on to the next house. And dad and I had that down to a science to fit it in before hockey. Um, but that gave me an end to getting to know families, right? And some of the elderly people who needed lines caught and everything else. So. You don't hear yeah. that, Greg. You don't hear that much with people in their jobs. I had a paper delivery room and I got fired and I certainly was chucking it when I did chuck it, not stopping and talking. Maybe there was a conversation or two, but not to the point where you made it within your time. It was a planned scheduled event, knowing that you're going to have to talk to Mrs. Jones or not. But also what was good is your insight. And I think that should be praised too. We're having people who see a need, especially at a young age, seeing a need that, okay, your grandfather needs his lawnmower, lawn mode. And then the other neighbor, because there was only a couple of people your age around to yeah. have the insight to know that there is a need and you're the one to meet it. And I think that should also be lifted up too for kids to take it upon themselves to see, you know, some simple things like there's a piece of garbage on the ground. Well, are you going to walk, literally walk over it, not to hit it and avoid it? Or are you actually going to pick it up? Is there someone in your neighborhood who has a need that you can, you know, use your energy and know-how and fill that need for them? Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's sad now. I'm two hours away from that community by highway driving. Um, mom is still there and there are no young people to fill the road. Now there's not as many, there's even fewer young people in that community now, mm -hmm. but of the young people that are there, there's no, I don't know if there's no drive amongst the young people that are there or if there's no sense of community to fill the role or where, what, what the missing link is, yeah. but if she needs work done, I either have to take some of the time on the weekend and drive out and do it, or we have to find an adult who's living at home unemployed, you know, due to COVID or whatever in right now and, and try to hook them up to do some work on the side for like, there's no getting a kid and throwing them 20 or 50 bucks, you know, to, to support them and to keep that sense of community there at the same time. Like that's gone. That's that. At least in that town, it is. It's, gone. Yeah, it's, it's pretty unfortunate. I think there are some kids peppered about, and those are the ones that they'll, in 20 years, have a story to say that I was the one that met that need, but it's yeah. so hard, especially when you're looking for them. So as you, you know, went through hockey and you were doing your paper delivery route, is there any other jobs that you had up and through middle school and high school? Uh outside of the family lot not a lot my grandfather was overseas for the second world war and brought home a war bride so nan was through veterans affairs they were allotted an allowance to pay people so it tickled nan pink that she could write checks, write checks for work that i went and did and now don't get me wrong it was never on the 
you know, it was always on the up and up. I, I punched the hours, but she took a great deal of pride in being able to do that. So a lot of my work was exactly what I've described. Around 16, I got a job at the local you pick strawberry farm weeding vast fields of strawberries. And I only lasted two days at that. And it's not due to my work ethic. I've always wondered if I actually got fired and I never did officially get fired. I just never got called back. Yeah. Uh, I think I was too meticulous of a weeder. Like I think, I think I was taking everything out of this giant field when they were looking for somebody to just bang through and clear out the majority. So I think I was a little bit too uh, meticulous on too the farm. And uh, the last summer of high school, um, I started pumping gas and I did that then for summers through, oh, wait, no, I've missed one too. No, I pumped gas from last summer of high school on through university and two summers in, during high school, I, like we had, I don't, I guess they had them in Nova Scotia too like government grants for student jobs allocated to different things. So some of them might have been cleaning up a small neighborhood like mine, like a make work, make work project. I landed a gig working to cash at a local art store, which was pretty cool because all the tourists that went through the province were dropping into this place. And, you know, again, being a pretty talkative guy, I got to chat with all the tourists that rolled through kind of thing. So Greg, knowing that you're in fitness now and as a teacher and doing something else, where did this desire come from? Because as you and I both went to Acadia, where did the desire come from where you decided to go to Acadia and take what you took? So the Acadia thing was a decision based on my small town syndrome, I'll say. Growing up around the Bay in Newfoundland, I guess I kind of got brainwashed into I wasn't going to the big city of St. John's which if you've been to St. John's you know it's not a big city um, but that was the mentality was that I didn't want to go to a big to a big town big city so I looked for small you know small town universities so I think the only places I applied outside of Memorial University was Acadia and St. FX um, so that's how I ended up at Acadia uh, now I live in St. John's and I absolutely love this city. Every day I love it more. Um, the drive to go down to Phys Ed route, I don't know. Um, from a plan book at home, like, you know, one of those school days books that my parents had, I, start, I, I switched my dream job from an NHL hockey player to Phys Ed teacher in grade eight. So I, I don't know what it was, if it was just, you know, your typical young boy, excuse me for a second, Brian. Yep, no problem. Those full animals. You, uh, you have three of those dogs. What kind of dogs are they? They're huge. Otter setters. They are huge. They're big, they're good dogs. Uh, I got my first setter. Well, I grew up with setters actually, but Gordon setters. And I got my first setter actually my last year at Acadia. And uh, ultimately, 14 years ago, my wife and I met at a dog park actually. And she showed up with a golden retriever. I had an Irish setter. We loved that golden retriever till the day she died just a couple of years ago. But Connor won Kathy's heart as an Irish setter. And now we have three Irish setters. So. Greg, you mentioned your dream of playing in the NHL, and that reminded me you played at Acadia in the Cheating Cup. Was that? Was that <laughs> yeah, I did. You some play? highs and lows from that. Yeah, like that was some great times at Acadia. Yeah, I, I wouldn't take back a day at Acadia to be honest. So this you. is Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, that we're referring to. So from your acceptance to Acadia, your your drive was consistently to be a physical education teacher. Pretty much. I mean, it, it wavered a little bit. You, you know, you would, you would hear chatter from teachers. There's a lot of teachers in my family. My dad was a teacher and a principal. Um, he never discouraged me from doing it. Although strangely, he did discourage my sister from doing it. She's also a teacher now too. Um, but you do hear the rumblings of, uh, you know, think long and hard, think twice about going into the education system. So I can't say my, my plan never wavered, but not significantly. Like, you know, just, I think 
the typical doubt that lots of people have, like, am I on the right path here? Am I doing the right thing? Now, with that said, when I finished my Bachelor of Physical Education, I went, am I pigeonholing myself here? Like, there's one phys ed teacher at best in every school. Mm. So am I going to get in with this? So I stayed at Acadia, actually, and did a primary elementary classroom degree as well. Um, and that did open up doors for the first few years of teaching in Nova Scotia. Like I would land term replacement contracts and things for teachers that were off. So before we get into the, what you're doing in, in that next chapter of your journey, you mentioned discouragement. Along the way, in terms of work, did you ever find, and this isn't to dive into you, but more so for listeners to understand the path that people take is not always linear. Did you experience discouragement in, you know, whether from pumping gas days into being at Acadia and taking the courses that you were taking until you received your first full-time job? Did you experience discouragement and uncertainty as to if what you were doing was the right path for you? Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that I did. I think most of my discouragement came post degrees. Um, the struggle to find work as a teacher is real. It's disheartening because most people who go into the teaching profession do have a passion to do it and they're very eager to do it. And I know people who have been substitute teaching literally for 15 years and have, have never even had a, a short term replacement. Um, so it was a bit trying early on. Uh, actually, it was the repeated, maybe not rejection, but let down of, of the education system as far as getting my foot in the door, but then having the door slammed on my foot is what drove me home to Newfoundland. So, so were you trying outside of Newfoundland as well? Well, after I finished at Acadia, I, I stayed in Nova Scotia. I was, I was teaching in Nova Scotia for the first four years of my career. Okay. But it was all, like I said, it was all term, term work. Like uh, one of your interviews the other day, something popped up about, you know, going in and, and presenting yourself to people. So the first day that I was eligible, the first administrative day, like school opening before students, that I was eligible with a teaching certificate, I walked into the brand new high school in the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia to shake hands and hand over my resume and, and tell them I was up for anything. And before I left, they, they, well, they said, are you willing to sub as a teacher? Obviously, yes. Are you willing to sub as a student assistant working one-on-one -on -one with students? Sure, I'll do anything. And before I left, I had already had four days booked. Yeah. Uh, like my first visit, I had four days booked. So I'm walking out the front doors of this building on cloud nine. This is gonna be easy. And all of a sudden the vice principal runs out the door behind me and he said, actually, there's a 40% uh, French, core French position. Would you be interested? And I said, I'm interested, but my French is fairly limited to about first year university. And he said, well, either you teach it or I teach it and I'm not teaching it. He said, bring in your resume and we'll see what we can do. And that's how I landed my first gig. So to be honest with you, Brian, there have been bumps in the road that have discouraged me. But to be honest, I think I've been one of the luckier ones. I've maybe even semi-charmed. Things have, have, have gone well for me. Not everything has gone well for me. Um, I probably had my dream job set up about three years later, teaching K-5 to phys ed in Kingston and my administration had full intentions of having me back and just people pulling strings for other people brought that crashing down around me. And that's when I decided to come home actually. So when you received the job that you have now, how long ago was that? Um, 13 years ago, I landed a grade seven classroom position in a rural community here in Newfoundland, my wife's hometown actually. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a year. And the very next year, the phys ed teacher in the neighboring communities school retired. And I moved into that. And my wife and I were both teaching at that small rural school for four years. And here in Newfoundland, rural schools are under the threat of closing just 
due to low numbers, low population and the economics of it. And they had threatened to close that school. And we didn't, we wouldn't have been out of work, but we didn't know where they would bump us to. Mm -hmm. That was the uncertainty. So we chose to make a decision in our best interests. And as much as it broke our hearts, we picked up and moved to the city. And I've been in this school as a phys ed teacher. This is my ninth year now. But in this position, having a contract with this school board is 13 years now. So what do you do in, in, a, in a week? I mean, COVID has put a twist on most people's position nowadays. But what would, a, as a physical education teacher, what is required of you? What do you do? How do you plan? What does a typical week look like for you? Uh, it's busy, to be honest with you. People would be very surprised how busy their gym teacher is. Um, planning has become, well, uh, in a typical year, planning has become pretty standard and easy for me now because there's a routine to it. Obviously, you're keeping things fresh and new for kids, but there is a routine to it. Now, with COVID, that throws a whole new level of planning in because I constantly now have to be prepared for the threat of everyone being sent home and going online. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a busy day, I, I and I tend to give up any and all of my spare time. I run any activities I can during a 15-minute recess break. I run lunchtime activities for kids, and I run after-school programming, too, which, sadly, all of that is kiboshed right now because of COVID. Um, but it's a busy day. I'm in a K-7 to school. I, um, I'm bringing them in and teaching them the very fundamental movement skills in a lot of cases, all the way to you know, the blossoming careers of young local athletes, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, are you getting into sports as well? Are you helping out oh, coaches? Yeah. Are you a coach yourself? Yeah. I, I, I guess if I were going to say I specialize in sport, I do volleyball for the main sport that I take after school. Um, and I organize coaches in, and, and I do track and field and cross country running, <laughs> uh, and the list will probably go as my memory comes to me, but you know, I help coordinate other coaches and bring volunteers into the building. Most of the co coaching platform is done by myself, a few other teachers, um, and any stable of parent volunteers I can, I can bring on board. Uh, and on top of that, that's the sport side of it. But uh, there's a few teachers of us that run a, a committee. We petition for grant money from the government every year. And we run a very extensive, actually, I was going to say pretty extensive, but a very extensive recreational program throughout the year, too. And we do it in blocks throughout the year. Um, I'd hold it up against any after school program. And I'll only go so far as to say in the province. Mm -hmm. But I'd put, it up against, <laughs> I'd put it up against a lot of programs. We're taking kids. We're taking kids orienteering and snowshoeing and swimming and cross country skiing and curling and all the traditional sports of basketball, volleyball, uh, floor hockey, you name it. We're exposing kids to it. We bring, we either bring in specialists to do it on our on site or we use the funding to bust them out to, to other facilities. To encourage you, Greg, here in Korea, dodgeball's big. <laughs> they, I find that they don't expose children. So in Korea, you either are going to be an athlete or you're not. And if you're not, there's very little use for sports. They have a gym class, but I do not think they expose kids to as, as many sports as they should be doing. So dodgeball is big and other smaller games like that or soccer. Yeah. Right. So, so what you're saying, especially Canada, right? And you have you know, the max of the four seasons. So yeah. you're, you're able to use and, and experiment with all of those sports that, you know, if you're down in Florida or something, you can't, hockey's not so big and you know, curling is not, snowshoeing doesn't exist. So yeah. it, it's really, it's commendable to take that upon because those are great experiences. Like if there's other, especially kids, if they're finding they're not academically inclined, well, ah, oh. I really enjoy going to my gym class with yeah. Mr. Jackman. Yeah. What do you find, Greg, is most difficult about your job? That's a really good question. I mean, it could be 
with the students. And yeah, and I was gonna say just before that, maybe we'll, we'll go back. How have you found in your young life and thinking the last 14 years, how kids attitude towards athletics or activity has changed? Because when we were younger, and you're speaking about being in a, in a two room house or a two school, was it? Two room schoolhouse. Two room schoolhouse. <laughs> the idea is to be outside and play until it was dinner time or go, you know, go help do something until it was dinner time and time to come in. Not all, but the majority now yeah. with technology, cell phones, you know, internet and all of that stuff, there's a pull away from that. So how do you find even from your own life or when you first got into education, kids view of being active and even physically, how are they managing with all of the sports that you're doing? Um, I would say in my gym, well, um, I pride myself on an ability to build rapport with kids of all ages. You don't see kids choosing or wanting to sit out in Mr. Jackman's phys ed class. It, it, it's almost unheard of. And it's been that way since I first started. Um, to be honest with you, even like when I first started subbing, like to, I'd go in as a phys ed sub in junior high, which is a dangerous place to be. And somehow I was able to get the kids who notoriously sat on the stage. I was able to get them up and moving. So in my gym, it doesn't, I don't think it's changed much at all. Um, a part of me, but maybe it's the curmudgeon in me wants to say that it's changed a lot in society mm -hmm. but i don't know if that's true like there's still lots of kids banging around like i did yeah you know there's a family that they've all moved on they had four kids and i ran into them one day downtown at like a concert outdoor concert facility or something and i was talking to the mom and i was like where are the kids and she's like well two of them are down there watching the concert and two of them are up in that tree and you know what i mean like there there are people still kind of active and and, and just playing and when we were kids, let's be honest, there were people who were not playing. Yeah, yeah. You and I did, but not everybody did. So would you say that that is commendable to your teaching ethic, your teaching practice, or is that, you know, where society is more curmudgeon and saying, oh, kids nowadays, and that we're just getting older and we hear more of that of what maybe our kids would have, or our parents would have said. I think we do do that. I think we're prone to saying that the, the young, I think every generation says that the un, younger generation is not what they were. And in some cases, that's going to be true because things get shed from society and things get shed from people's desire. But the next generation also finds new and better things to be a part of or new and better things to involve themselves in now don't get me wrong my passion is in people being active my passion is the outdoors to be honest with you so when i see like my neighborhood kids are very outdoorsy and it warms my heart to see it that's probably why a lot of our after school recreational program is in the outdoors um but i think people deserve more credit than sometimes we give them i think a lot of people are active should more people be active 100 percent and not to get ahead of you, but we mentioned earlier that now I've just recently taken on a role. I got, you know, asked, would you, I started training at a local gym three years ago and I recently got asked to start coaching there. And I decided I wanted to, for the same reason, I wanted to be a leader in that environment. That if, if more of these adults had have been given more attention in the phys ed part of their schooling, they'd be a lot more comfortable in the gym that I'm seeing them in now. It's, it's funny from my question, it seems like the problem isn't the kids. The problem is the adults. <laughs> I w I've wondered since the day we got sent home from school for COVID, I wonder how many families are not going to go back to scheduling every minute of their days because scheduling is hugely important. It, it creates structure. It, it it sets the precedent for responsibility and punctuality and everything else but children and adults alike need to take time to step away and 
be lost in wanderlust for a lack of a better term like you know to go into nature go into your local park mm -hmm. and stroll around and admire something as simple as the ducks in the in the pond it doesn't have to be high intensity exercise to be beneficial to your physical well-being rejuvenating you yeah. right so you know uh, mm -hmm. I and That's to get back question. to the point yeah. To get back to the point of the scheduling, like a lot of families here anyway, were very uh, open about sharing that, wow, I love this newfound downtime with my family. We get to play together. We get to pretend and, or, you know, or go for a hike or a bike ride. Like bike sales in St. John's were off the charts this summer. It's interesting. Are they going to hold on to that? Or as soon as everything gets up and running, are they going to over schedule themselves again? Not just their kids, they're over scheduling their families, in my humble opinion. You know what I mean? Like to each yeah. their own. You do what you want. You, you, you know, as long as you're not bringing harm to somebody, I'm a firm believer in doing what you, what is for you and for your family. But it just, again, it warms my heart to see families so proud and ecstatic of their recreational time together that I, I hope they hold on to it when the time comes. Well, I think it takes people like you also to maybe journal, um, record what you're doing now. And, and I also commend you on your, your mental health uh, awareness by doing your push-ups, and you got me to do it. And I, yeah, it's, it's thanks for joining, great, but you're doing it in a way that, um, sheds a story on you know different aspects of life and and helping bring awareness to mental health but also what you're saying here is with being keeping people physically active and to maybe even journal this to record it and, and remind people later on down the road of all the benefits that we experienced back in 2020 or you know however long this goes because we are people who are prone to forget yeah. Like we'll get stuck back into that scheduling. We'll go, okay, we got to do this. We got to do this. Hurry up. Hurry, hurry. Hey, hey, yeah. hey, remember in 2020 when you and your family just went for a walk in the woods for three hours and you brought a little picnic basket and how much yeah. fun that was and it didn't hurt any of your scheduling. Exactly. So to, to, I, I would think that this would be something that is good for anyone to do ourselves included is to remind ourselves and to remind other people that yeah. we don't need to be so rigid. It's good to have scheduling, yeah. but to take some of that and schedule some free time and some family time and individual time as well. A hundred percent. So, so Greg, thinking of the kids who may be better off than the adults <laughs> um, and in your job and in your work, what is difficult for you? What is that most difficult thing that you come across? Um, uh, Brian, I, I feel spoiled in saying that I don't encounter a lot of difficulty in my job. Like I say, kids are cooperative for the most part. I guess, if anything, the difficult part is keeping things fresh for them. Do you know what I mean? Like, to go back to the kind of the younger generation, but, you know, like, we are competing with all the technology that they're surrounded with. You don't want any programming, whether you're teaching math or language or you know, science or, or, or phys ed, you don't want to kind of start resting on your laurels and it's just predictable what you're doing year to year. So I guess one challenge is keeping things, probably my biggest challenge is keeping things fresh for kids, really. You mentioned to me earlier before we recorded that you were doing some new programs. How do you stay fresh? What is it you look to for some inspiration? What Where do you find some new programs or... Other phys ed teachers, other phys ed teachers are, are easily my best resource. Um, and I mentioned to you earlier that that has expanded now, thankfully, due to COVID. It, it's kind of weird. I, 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 I have felt guilty saying this to people because I know the, the, sincerely know the tragedy that people have been through during COVID from job loss to uh, isolation in a home that is struggling to put food on a table or is dealing with abuse within that home to the loss of family members through COVID or other extenuating things. But strangely, the whole pandemic experience has 
has been a bit of a blessing for me. Um, I, so I guess what I'm getting at is I've reached out to a lot more people during the pandemic. I've been forced to, my hands were tied. I couldn't meet with colleagues locally. So what did I end up doing? I ended up meeting brand new colleagues all around the world. So for example, as, as teachers in China were starting to ramp back up into their system, we were just kind of sliding into the pit of what the pandemic was bringing to North America. Yeah. So as we were trying to get our heads around, how are we going to deal with this online learning thing, this big boogeyman, I was connecting with teachers in China who yeah. were kind of coming out the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to loop back to answer your question, I guess my best resource for keeping things fresh and new are other phys ed teachers, to be honest with you. And so there you are, do that there are online. Around the world. Sorry, what's that? Online and and I think you mentioned earlier as well, podcasting, listening. There's gym professionals. Listening to yeah, there's a few really strong phys ed teachers that deliver through podcasting. Um, there's a few very strong leaders in the phys ed world uh, internationally that have put together uh, webinar series of webinars. You know, like um, a guy who teaches out of uh, of British Columbia now, Nathan Horn. He just did like a, you know, phys ed summer camp. So it's just a series of webinars from different phys ed teachers around the world uh, throughout the summer to stay on top of your game, getting ready to go back in into it this September. So for anyone that looking into becoming a physical education teacher, do you have the freedom within a school year to teach whichever sport you would like, or is that um, dictated to you by the province and the curriculum that they give you? Well, there's a dictated curriculum. Um, you can be as creative as you want in filling that curriculum. Do you know what I mean? So there are suggestions in, in the curriculum as to how you can, you can achieve different outcomes, but there's nothing holding you to their suggestions. They're just that suggestions. So, you know, you can explore different sports from around the world or sports from the history of an indigenous population at times or your traditional sports that everybody sees, you know, on NBC Olympic broadcasts. Like, you, there's room in the curriculum for the children to invent games. So there's lots of opportunity to change things up for kids throughout the year. That's encouraging to know. Greg, what brings you satisfaction? even though there's not much difficulty, but what, what might bring you the most satisfaction in your work as a physical education teacher? Um, that light bulb moment for a child that they can do something that they didn't think they could. And to be honest, I get to see it a lot in phys ed. I really do. People don't realize what they're capable of physically. A lot of people of all ages are very out of touch with what they're able to do with the miracle of the body that they own. Um, and children come in with those walls up early, that I can't attitude. And you're in and K through seven. So you're really at that developmental. Very much. Period. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can get a kindergarten who is amazed that you know, they jumped off, you know, uh, a foot high structure and, and stuck a landing on, on a, a gym in a gym on a gym mat you know like as if they're finishing a gymnastics routine and they're amazed that they did it literally ryan hands out and everything um and you know that kid who comes to you and says i can't i can't shoot baskets because i'm too small and somewhere along the way whether through themselves or through things they've seen in the media or through a friend or a family member they've been convinced or convinced themselves that they're too small to shoot a basket and you give them the skills to do it and they've conquered something magical when when they accomplish it and that's a pretty much a daily routine for me to be honest with you it reminds me of my my daughter's french immersion teacher um, that i asked her why do you do what you do i go because i teach you know grade three four and five and how do you teach <coughs> grade one or two and she goes because i can i can start the beginning of the year knowing they can't read and at the end of the year, they're reading. And that's huge. Yeah. Like from being able to not 
hold a ball to be able to put it through a net or, you know, so scared to jump off a plank onto a mat. Those are, those are like for adults, uh, I, not for all, but generally speaking, like, oh, that's just, you know, just do it. You know, we know, yeah. but for a kid, that's huge. It's very big. Yeah. And very it helps big. their confidence immensely. Greg, uh, you, I think so. Yeah. You mentioned something earlier about wanting people to understand, but what would there be that maybe parents, administration, um, just people on the outside don't understand about your job that you would like them to understand. The immense value of it. I think if you, we could scour pop culture for all the disparaging jokes at the feet of a phys ed teacher and it is what it is. And, you know, all people, all walks of life, all careers are, you know, the butt end of a joke. But people really don't realize the vast accomplishments inside a gymnasium, to be honest. Uh, obviously, like in any occupation, career or workspace, there are some people who are doing a better job than others and making it a better experience for the people in front of them. But again, I stand by the fact that the vast majority of teachers are there because that's what they want to do is affect lives in a positive way. And people don't realize the power of a gymnasium. People understand the fun of a gymnasium, but they don't understand the power of what goes on in there. Like the sense of accomplishment, the sense of confidence that can be built, the cooperation skills that are developed in a gym, uh, the sense of self-worth that can be found in a gym, like the fitness, the fitness per se is, I almost want to say an afterthought. Yeah. You know, like, and now, and again, things change once you get into the junior high and high school ages, but really I'm looking to make people, well, I mean, you know, one of the new phrases that's been around now for quite a few years in phys ed is physical literacy, mm -hmm. like just competence with your body. And once you provide somebody with competence with their body, it, it changes everything, like, you know, developing spatial awareness leads to better drivers on our roads when you think about it. Um, being able to perform, and this is not a great example from the primary age group, but you know, being able to perform a squat, it ensures your ability to get out of a chair as you grow older. It all comes back to how well we can use our bodies. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a lover of academics as well, and those are things that you undoubtedly carry through till your old age. But physical competency is, is a, you're using your body all day, every day, other than when you're lying in bed. So I think it goes a long way. We, I think we accomplish a lot in the phys ed program, to be honest. No, you're right. It's, it's something people should understand. And I think a lot of people do if they take a step back and get rid of whatever you're saying, the, the comments or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's, I think back in some of my greatest times were in gym class. And I remember all my, like a, Pat Henneberry, like just a great teachers that, you know, you could even trust, you can, you can go to for advice outside of gym class, just people. Yep. And then even now I still know um, my gym teachers and they were great yep. all along the way. Greg, if someone's wanting to get into being a, a teacher in general, a physical education <clears throat> teacher in particular, what advice, and maybe they're looking back and maybe they're one of those kids that are mowing lawns in their neighborhood or <laughs> pumping gas in their local gas station, but looking at their career path or even someone that took a different degree and they're looking at changing their career into teaching, what advice would you have for them? Um, first off, be sure you wanna do it, to be honest. And that goes for any part of the education system. Um, it's not glamorous outside the walls of school. You are a rock star in the eyes of a child, um, but it's not a glamorous job by any stretch. Um, so make sure you want to be a teacher before, not before you start your path, but as you're on the journey, check in with yourself kind of thing. I, I mentioned to you earlier, I watched, somebody sent a video my way today actually that spoke about, you know, that that first gut feeling you get about being a teacher. And I believe that's true. Like I said earlier, I don't recall any light bulb moment 
but I just, at some point in life, I just knew it's what I would end up doing. Experience that you can gain fairly easily, uh, volunteering, uh, you know, you can, you can easily go, out, not easily, I shouldn't say that, but you can easily, relatively easily, go out and get trained to coach in different sporting events. You can take that into the sporting world, which gives you experience working with children and delivering, you know, whether it be drills or organizing practices or whatever. Um, yeah, I would say volunteering at a very young age would be a, would be a big part of it. And start dabbling in it at a young age. You know, like uh, a job that I didn't get as a young person that I really wanted was with the local rec program. And it, it, I was very discouraged that I didn't get that job because I knew even as, as in my teenage years that it was something I wanted and believed I was meant to do. Um, but getting on board with programs at a young age to to expose yourself. Um, another job that I didn't mention earlier that I took a lot of pride in and had a big part in following through on the education phys ed thing. Uh, I traveled to the States for two summers and, and taught in sports camps down there. There's lots of opportunities. I don't think there's anything out be beyond the fact of having to achieve your education to back you, whether it's a teaching certificate depending on where you live or a university degree or whatever you have to get in that regard. I think the other thing is experience because the experience will go back to the first thing I said, the experience working with children will tell you if it's something you want to do or not beyond the shadow of a doubt. Even, even what you said about not getting that rec job, if you find you have some opportunity, what you believe is an opportunity and it doesn't present itself at that time, but the desire to still do it and the drive to keep going despite that setback yeah. may be an indicator that this path may be the right one for you. A hundred percent. Yeah. Cause you, well, like you said, drive. yes. But like you said, you're going to hit bumps in the road. Things are not going to go. Like I, I mentioned, things have gone pretty smoothly for me. That doesn't mean things have gone flawlessly for me. Yeah. You know, you, you don't cakewalk your way into a career. It's just not going to happen. Um, bumps in the road teach you lessons if you're looking for them. And like you just said, they, it's a gut check for yourself as to whether or not it really is something you want. It, there's, there's no doubt about it. Is so, there? Go ahead, Greg. Well, just I was just going to reiterate: getting yourself out there is is is, is paramount, if you ask me, and not because you're going to become well known, leading you to a job or a career necessarily. It may, but but more I think it's more about putting yourself out there so that you find out more about you, because you can start honing skills for a future career very early in life, if you're self-reflective. And if you're asking questions, like there's, there's a lot you can do at a young age just by exposing yourself to things. Greg, on, on that same line, do you have any advice for people, regardless of the type of work, but that may be discouraged, uh, uncertain of their career path? They might find themselves in a job they dislike, or they might have management that they're not fond of. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they're wanting to try something new or they just need a, a reminder of the initial motivation that brought them on this path. Because we do, as we mentioned earlier, we get discouraged, you know, things happen. You and I were speaking, um, people in our lives, we lose them. Right. And, and then, you know, a whole different day is presented before us or things with COVID and stuff like that. And there's lots of bumps in the road that discourage us or push us off. Do you have any advice for people um, in their work or in their journey with work? I think there's lots of things you can do if you're faced with that discouragement or adversity. Uh, it, uh, it probably does depend on your personal circumstances, who you're surrounded by. I think patience is a big thing. If, if you do become discouraged in any facet of life, work, relationships or whatever else, I think people need to develop a greater sense of patience to see things through. 
Um, there are peaks and valleys in everything we do. You know, every day is not as rosy as the previous one. And it's likely not going to be as dark as the one you might be living in the moment. Now, yeah. But um, patience would be a big thing. Um, I go so far as to say self-talk if you're not surrounded by people who you can turn to, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, to check in with yourself as to where your discouragement may lie or what things you can do to change your situation. Um, and if, if you're lucky enough to be surrounded by people who don't have to have all the answers, but can play a sounding board for you to share your ideas with, um, I think that's vastly important. I know I've been guilty over the years of maybe losing touch with people who would have provided wonderful advice. I haven't talked to you and I think we calculated it at 21 years or something. And you gave me good advice this evening. So keeping people in your life, they don't have to be immediately close to you, but people that you can talk to so that when you run into those moments of discouragement, not that they necessarily can give you a pep talk and set everything straight, but like I said, they can be your sounding board. A sound, having people to be your sounding board is, is invaluable, absolutely invaluable. I'm fortunate enough that my wife is that person in my life. Not that there aren't others, but she is my primary one. Mm -hmm. It's a sense of grounding to everything I do. Um, but yeah, I think turning to other people, turning inward for yourself and, and self-reflection and, and being patient. Greg, speaking of other people, how could people reach you if they wanted to talk to you? But maybe there's some people out there on the rock that want to get into uh, education or... Yeah, for sure. Around. Uh, um, you can, I can share with you an email address. I got a Twitter handle, Mr. GJ 77. Uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm a bit of a hit and miss Facebooker, but that's always a possibility. Um, but yeah, if there's anybody out there who ever wanted uh, some insight or advice or connections made, maybe I might be able to help somebody somewhere down the road. You never know. Greg, how, how do you rest? So you're a physically active person, but how do you rest from your work? How do you separate yourself? What is it you do? That's never been a challenge for me, Brian. I don't know why, but I have always described myself as a hobbyist. I love my own recreational ventures. Um, so I may come home exhausted at the end of a day mm -hmm. and I'll load my kayak into the back of my truck and go float around a pond for an hour. And I might not be paddling very hard because I might be pretty tired, yeah. but I'll paddle out. I, every year I know one spot on a local lake where eagles come and nest every year. And that's one of my favorite things to do to relax is to go and from a distance, just sit and watch those eagles as they raise two eaglets most years. Um, I sleep very well. I don't have much trouble sleeping. Um, my wife and I like to share a lot of hobbies. We're not big TV people, but we might take a half hour or an hour to flake out in front of the TV some evenings if we feel we need it. Um, but yeah, no, relaxing has never been a problem for me. Looking back from mowing the lawns and throwing some, well, actually not even throwing the newspaper, but talking to your... <laughs> your neighbors and handing them the paper and maybe even telling them the news before they get it and saying, <laughs> how has your work helped shape your character? So thinking of an answer in terms of the listeners and how important work is, how has work helped shape your character? I don't know how this answer will come off, Brian, but I think my character has shaped my work more than my work has shaped my character, to be honest with you. Um, I think from a young age, I have been interested in the well being of other people. And I don't just mean physical well being, like just the general well being of others. Um, and I think that has made me successful, to be honest with you. Um, 
I'm quick and willing to talk to anybody. I, I'm, I'm not one to, to prejudge anybody on, you know, any of the topics that people get prejudged on, whether the color of their skin or their socioeconomic status in society or, you know, their religion or any, like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm a firm believer in a human being as a human being. And I think that outlook on life has served me well, to be honest with you. I, uh, I'm, I've probably lived life overly cautious that I was going to offend someone, but to my credit, I don't think I've offended many people through my comings and goings. I do speak my mind. I'm not afraid to say what I believe in. But while speaking my mind, I wholeheartedly believe in the opinion of the other person. Uh, maybe not believe in it, but I value that they yeah. have something. And I like to let people know that I value their opinion or their insight or their suggestions. Um, and I think those things, I carry those things into a classroom as well. Like I, I don't look at the students that I teach as lesser than myself. Yes, I have to have control of the room. I'm the leader in the room, but it doesn't make me more important than a six-year-old. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I'm not, I'm not a more important human being walking the planet. So, you know, that's not something I've just carried through my life with, you know, friends and colleagues and family members. It's something I've portrayed to my students as well, and I, I think it's served me well. I think it's led to the type of teacher I've become. Now, I, to get that's to a good question, answer. Yes. Where my career has affected who I am mm -hmm. beyond the shadow of a doubt, but I, I would put my character as a greater influence on my career. It's, and that's a better way of looking at it. And I don't, there's people that are shaped by their career, which probably would be detrimental to their character in most instances, if they're fully um, shaped by what it is they're doing. And then they are disheartened because they are their work opposed to influencing their work for something better. And it's something about you. I, we've known each other for 20, 30, almost 25 years, I guess, is about you is that you're consistently kind. I couldn't say anything um, against your character. And I felt that you always from, I guess, to be honest, what little we know of each other in the period of time we knew each other is that you were consistently kind and that you did value me despite my erroneous views, right? Or er erroneous ways. And for that, I appreciate because what you're saying is absolutely true of what I know of you. Well, I, have, I appreciate your kind words too. It's, it is true. Greg, I have one final question for you, young man. Fire away. Why do you work? Okay, so this is your question that I've really cheated on. I haven't scripted an answer, but I, uh, but I have an answer. Yeah. I think we all work for the future. I think we're working, yes, we're working for financial gain, but it's for the future. Whether it's to put food on our tables the next day, or whether it's to buy the new toy that one of you know you or your child want, or whether it's putting money away for uh, your child's education down the road or your retirement or whatever, um, I think we all work for the future. And lots of careers could say it, but also as a teacher, in that capacity, you're working for the future in a much yeah. greater sense socially so i hope i don't lose points for cheating but as i listen to your show that's what struck me is i think we work for the future we're not working for the past well it's it's a great point and you're the first one to say it the way you have but this is what i want listeners especially younger people it's for your future and when you're younger and not all maybe not you um, you're not thinking that the future is so long or all the things that you have to do for your future. You're, many kids think about now uh, or younger people think about now and maybe tomorrow or next week or next year, but not, okay, when I lose my, my mom or my dad, 
how, how is, you know, who's going to pay for that? Or when I retire, how is that going to be paid for? And yeah. thinking more and, and just reminding people it's for your future. And I don't yeah. think that's cheating at all. Thanks. <laughs> Mr. Greg Jackman, I appreciate you. I appreciate you being a teacher in the public school district. And I, I think you have some things on your horizon that you're looking to do. Um, and I hope you all the best in all that you do. Thanks, buddy. You too.